Education is what's important. Training, preparation for the expected. Education, preparation for the unexpected. Team Team Crew Life community, and on behalf of Marine Corps University, the Marine Corps University Foundation, and the Brute Crew Lack Center for Innovation and Future Warfare, welcome back to the Brutecast, our series designed to connect the worlds of the warfighter and PME with the best in innovative and creative thought. I'm your host, Major Ian Brown, the Operations Officer at the Crew Lack Center. Before we begin, please remember that all opinions expressed here are those of the individual and do not necessarily reflect the views of the Crew Lack Center, Marine Corps University, the United States Marine Corps, or any other agency of the U.S. government. We'll also be recording this webcast for the benefit of those in our community of interest who can't join us live today. So we ask that you be mindful of keeping your microphones muted to avoid disrupting the presentation, as well as keeping your own webcams off to help us stream smoothly. At the conclusion of our presentation, we will have a Q&A session. So once we get to that, you're free to turn on your mics and I will call on you um, in the order I receive your questions, uh, you turn on your webcam, you can talk to our guests here today live. Uh, so if you do have a question, just go ahead and let me know in the chat room first. And then as I get them, I'll, I'll just call on you in the order received. Okay, so today's episode kicks off our webcasting season for academic year 2022. And our first guest for this season is here to examine uh, an aspect of something, uh, one of the focus areas that our commanding general at MCU is asking students and faculty to look at this year, which is future warfare. So the question today is, how do Marines, and indeed how do leaders of all kinds, make the right decisions at the right time in a digital age of technology-enhanced warfare? To explore this question, we are very pleased to welcome back a broadcast veteran and Krulak Center non-resident fellow, Edward D. Hess. He is Professor Emeritus of Business Administration Batten Fellow and Batten Executive in Residence Emeritus at the Darden Graduate School of Business, University of Virginia, and the author of Hyper Learning, How to Adapt to the Speed of Change, which was published by Barrett Kohler in August of 2020. Professor Hess has spent 20 years in the business world as a senior executive and has spent the last 18 years in academia. He is the author of 13 books and over 140 articles and 60 Darden case studies. His work has appeared in over 400 global media outlets, including Fortune Magazine, European Business Review, HBR, SHRM, Fast Company, Wired, Forbes, Huffington Post, Washington Post, Business Week, The Financial Times, the CNBC Squawk Box, Fox Business News with Maria Bart Bartiroma, Big Think, Wall Street Journal Radio, Bloomberg Radio with Kathleen Hayes, Dow Jones Radio, MSNBC Radio, Business Insider, and Wharton Radio. His recent books and research have focused on human excellence in the digital age, a new way of being, a new way of working, humanizing the workplace, and hyperlearning. So, sir, welcome back to the broadcast, and I will turn things over to you. Thank you very much, Major. It's 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 wonderful being back with you, and uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, thank you for joining me. Uh, I'm going to give a short overview, and hopefully, we can have a conversation and make meaning together and because your input's very, very important because you're on the front lines of this. And basically what I've been focusing on some is really how is technology going to transform warfare? And if you think of what's coming down the pike in te technology, we already have cyber warfare going on, if you will. But technology is going to be able to be embedded in the very near future in the human beings. And for humans to be able to monitor their their vital signs, their reaction signs, but also at some point in time, and not that far away, technology will be a will be able to receive, if you will, technology in our bodies will be able to receive messages coming from outside of our bodies. Augmented reality is real and it's big. All right, and you know, so. Marines will be able to basically be wearing glasses and be able to get satellite pictures so that they can see around corners, for example. Smart drones and mini satellites are already very active, but the mini satellite area of the military is going to expand exponentially in the last two years, exp in the next two years. We got exoskeletons. We got obviously smart robots. We got autonomous decisions and we got technology now 
that is basically making this can make decisions itself without input from human beings. Technology now can basically learn as it goes without us. And how does that play into, if you think about it, an adversary that's using technology to e either disrupt your communications, disrupt, if you will, your, par uh, if you will, ways of, of dealing with an adversary, um, disrupt, if you will, the story and create fictional stories that, that you are seeing or that you perceive coming at you. We also, within 10 years, Marines will be able, if they make the decision, to be able to basically have a neural net placed on top of our, your brains to basically have your brain connect with technology without if you will, us writing something, type, typing something, saying something, but it will, it will connect with our brains as our brains is working and interconnect. All of this can be mind boggling, but this is not make believe. And what this all means from a warfare viewpoint is, is that the speed and frequency of change will increase and it will require constant fast decision making, real time responses. And that will require the highest level of human decision making, human thinking, and human management of oneself. If you think about it, how do you train? A leader, a Marine, to make the right decisions in a very volatile, fast-paced, changing environment where technology itself can learn and quickly adapt to every response that basically a human being makes. How does a human, how do you train a human being, how do you train a Marine to come into that environment and what type of behaviors and what type of thinking and what type of managing self needs to occur in order for a Marine to go into a digital warfare environment where the pace of change is so fast, taking into con context how we're wired, how we're wired. And this is a huge challenge. It's a challenge about who you recruit, how you train, if you will, how do you continuously update people's stories about the world and how it works. And it's and the human challenge for the digital age is even made more complex because of the science of adult learning is clear. We are suboptimal learners. We are suboptimal learners, all of us are. We are wired to be speedy, efficient thinkers. Our brain burns a lot of energy. And we're wired, therefore, to be highly efficient. We go out in the world, and this is all neuroscience and science. This is all, if you will, the, 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 the actuality. We go out in the world to seek confirmation of what we believe. I go out in the world and come across lots of stimuli. First of all, we process a very, very small percent of all the stimuli that's out there. And I go out in the world and I see what I believe. And I'm just gonna pick some names. I don't know you and I hope I have permission just to use your first name at, at this point, but you know, Dave goes out, you know, Ian goes out, uh, Lauren goes out in the world. You see what you believe. We go out in the world to seek confirmation of what we believe. We go out in the world to seek affirmation of our ego. And we're inclined to be emotionally defensive when our views of our world are challenged. And then lastly, 
we seek cohesiveness of our mental models, the story of how the world works. So think about it. In a fast-paced digital warfare world where it's constantly changing and the human component of our of our warfare, we are highly inefficient and we are basically suboptimal learners because of those things I mentioned, but then you can add on cognitive blindness, cognitive dissonance, and various other, other biases. You can add on ego gets in the way of learning, fear gets in the way of learning. We fundamentally are fast, efficient, reflexive confirmation machines. So how do we train Marines to excel in a different environment where we have to overcome all of these, quote, embedded limitations, all right? And what to end up becoming what I call a hyper learner, to be able to go out in the world and learn, unlearn, and relearn at the speed of change. And how can that happen? How can that happen? Well, first of all, the humans that are involved have got to accept the science that says we're suboptimal learners. And that's pretty hard for people to do, especially people that are at high levels in organizations because they're successful. But the reality of it is the environment is completely changed and what made us successful in the environment that existed is not going to make us successful in the environment that's coming. And it will take Marines and Marine leadership creating a new story of what it means to be smart, all right? What it means to be smart. And it will take a huge focus training-wise on basically training people to manage what's going on inside their body. They're what's going on with their ego, what's going on with their mind, what's going on with their body, their, what's going on physically, and what's going on with them emotionally. Because the science is very clear. When we go out in the world, and it's extremely volatile, and stuff is coming at us quickly, all right? What's so important in being able to receive that, process, potentially process it, and then deal with it is all highly dependent and influenced greatly by what's going on inside of us. And so going forward, all right, going forward, training people where they can take ownership of what's going on inside of them with the goal being a state of inner stillness and calmness that enables you to embrace the world as it is with your most non-judgmental, fearless, open mind with a lack of self-absorption, being one with reality. And that involves having a quiet ego, a quiet mind, a quiet body, a calm body, and being in an emotional state that is not negative or fearful. Now, that should ring some resonance with some of you because that type of training, you know, does occur in certain pockets of the United States military. And I'm pausing to let you think about that. Where in the Marine Corps do people spend a lot of time dealing with training people to basically manage what's going on inside of their body so that they can go into warfare 
if you will, being able to be open to process and react real time and to continuously adapt. And the science of, of, if you will, human behavior and the science of neuroscience and the science of emotions tell us that anyone can be trained in this way. It's hard work. It takes a lot of time and the training never ends. But the fact is, if you think about it, digital warfare is going to be conducted by who? Digital warfare is going to be conducted by Marines that are on the ground, right? But who else is going to be involved in conducting digital warfare? People that are not on the ground, that are sitting in either secure areas or sitting in, you know, we'll call it just offices at different places. And they're going to basically either be making decisions or having input and giving feedback to people on the ground or basically giving, making decisions that's going to digitally send, if you will, responses to the basically invader, et cetera. So the training and the type of people and the work that's gonna happen, digital warfare, not everyone is going to be on the ground in the middle of traditional warfare. Digital warfare can be occur by having human beings either in bunkers or in different special secure locations, and people are sitting there in civilian clothes, all right? Not wearing a helmet, not carrying weapons. And so how the digital warfare game plays out raises the question, all right, raises the question, what kind of training programs do we need in order to train people to be able to react at the pace of the activity, bringing their best self to the situation and that best self is not hindered by fear, ego, predispositions, but people are open to sense, sense making. Sense making is gonna be a critical, critical skill. And so the question comes down to, all right, who and how do we train people? How do we train people to reach the state that someone can go into an unknown situation and be highly aware because their mind is quiet, highly focused, highly non judgmental because they're trying to sense what's going on, not trying to make it fit into a mental model or a story. How can they can keep their body calm? so that the emotional side, the chemicals in our body is not going to basically get in the way of our, interp our receipt and interpretation and response. How do we do that? And, and the answer is, there is a way to do that. And then the answer is, depends on how do we start training people to do that? And, and basically, it's each individual that is that is part of the warfare team. And that can be Marines on the ground. It can be Marines in the bunker. It can be Marine technologists. It can be basically uh, civilians that are part of the Marine um, contingent. How do we basically train people to come to the table with ability to be completely open and highly aware and perceptive without biases, without preconceived notions, and have our body chemically be in such a way, 
calmness that we basically are not misinterpreting what we're seeing to respond to the foray from, okay, the opposing party, which foray is digital, not, if you will, within my site, not within, in fact, can be coming from us from not even the same territory that we're in. Let me just pause for a moment and let, let this think in. And I want to leave some ideas with you. The how. And what the science and history tells us. If we're looking to transform ourselves as human beings so that we can basically bring our best unbiased self, our best self from an emotional viewpoint, our best self quiet mind viewpoint where we're actually focused, a quiet ego. And the reason the quiet ego is so important it goes back to the point that we go out in the world and we're looking for confirmation of what we believe, confirmation of our ego. We're wrapped up in what we our stories of how the world works. Well, when the world is going to change as fast as it's going to in the digital age, and especially digital warfare, it will be changing, it will be changing all through the interaction of digital warfare. How do I how do I quickly sense it? How do I prepare myself? And I want to leave with you three or four ideas about how does an individual prepare him or herself to continuously adapt and, and learn and perceive what's going on with the least in inhibition internally. And it and it comes comes down to four different things. Daily personal intentions, people having a having thought through, being trained, being educated as to how do I manage myself cognitively, emotionally, and behaviorally so that I can bring my basically state of inner stillness and calmness that enables me to embrace the world in our most non-judgmental, fearless, open mind with a lack of self-absorption, being one with the reality. Quiet ego, quiet mind, quiet body. It starts out with my intentions. How do I want to be? And then the second phase is adopting daily personal practices that enable quiet ego, quiet mind, calm body, management of emotions, and working on those daily practices on a dev daily basis and sharing with colleagues what you're working on and getting frequent feedback. And then for the team that you're part of, to have daily team group hyper learning practices. Clearly, digital war games in small teams with positive, rigorous after action reviews. But sense making exercises how do I make sense of something? Figuring out the unknown exercises. Critical thinking exercises, reflective listening exercises, stress calmness training, how to basically truly listen to others, how to be able to have high quality making meaning conversations with others without letting the personal stuff get in the way. And then lastly, the working individually on improving 
the soft skills, the digital age behaviors that are so necessary, the words I've mentioned. Working on having an open mind, working on humility, working on empathy, working on being totally present, et cetera, et cetera, courage and resilience. And this whole concept is really in order to transform Marines, the Marine Corps to be a world-class technology enhanced warfare organization. An organization doesn't transform unless the people transform. And so accepting the reality that we're going to have to train differently. We're going to have to become differently because there is no history of us being able to perform at the speed and intensity with the incoming being multifaceted, digitally oriented, with real time changes being able to come by the data that the enemy is basically picking up on what we're doing. So that in a nutshell, I invite you to consider that as you confront the digital warfare challenge, and I know it's top, top of top of mind for you, it's even more than top of mind, you're already engaged in it. I invite you to consider the human perspective, the Marine perspective, the leader perspective as to how, what do we need to do to put our people in the position that they won't be highly stressed. They won't make bad decisions. We won't have, if you will, high turnover. That we're able to basically perform at a different level because the environment is, is going to change. And then putting together, if you will, the if you will, the I'm searching for the right word, the test, all right, basically the prototype and testing your prototype. And then how do you continually keep that product if you, as you expand and deliver, deliver on a daily basis, the updates and the training that people need. Those are some of the things that I have been thinking deeply about, and I know all of you have been thinking about. And I'll close with this. Will your current training programs enable or inhibit digital warfare excellence? Do you need an enhanced model that takes into account the human differences between real-time digital warfare and traditional warfare? Do you need to expand the human aspects, the human behaviors, the embedded human way of being into your training model all through your ranks. And what does this mean for your recruiting? What does this mean for your enlisted and officer leadership pass? What's it mean for your structure and your organization? And the real time digitally updating of one's skills. I'll, I'll open it now to questions if you, you I'm, well, I'd like to leave, leave one more comment. 
I assume that probably everybody on this call in some way is, you know, or that's highly likely that many of you do physical training every day. And I suggest to you that the Marine of the future is not only going to do physical training every day, but is going to do mind training and is going to basically do emotional training and thinking training every day because that's going to be necessary in order to be an elite warrior. Okay, Ian. All right, great. Thank you very much, sir. And uh, like I said in the chat, to anyone who has a question for our guest today, you can go ahead and start just uh, letting me know in the chat and I'll start calling on you. And uh, first off, I'm going to call on our director, Ms. Valerie Jackson. I know she had a couple of questions. Um, so, ma'am, if you want to go ahead and start things off with the things you had queued up. Great. Thank, thanks, Ian. Thanks, Ed. I appreciate you uh, coming on uh, again. Um, I do have a couple, but I'll start with one and give others a chance to, uh, to pipe in as well. Um, you've outlined in your book that it's key for leaders to demonstrate vulnerability in order to, to foster trust with those whom they lead. Um, this concept can be especially difficult for senior military leaders. Do you have recent examples of senior military leaders demonstrating vulnerability that you can share? I know you've worked with some groups in the past, but I think that'd be helpful for this audience. Thank you. Uh, that's an outstanding question, Val. And, and vulnerability can be evidenced by a senior leader saying, when you're dealing with questions and everything, I don't know. Vulnerability can be after some occurrence, the senior leader basically saying, you know, I made the wrong call. I didn't take into account this. Or in, in other words, I think that that vulnerability, I don't think is giving up your position of command in any way. But I think it's being possibly more human in the sense that nobody is perfect. And when you hold yourself to the same type of after action reviews, when you hold your in, in, and ask from your direct reports feedback, all right, and you take feedback and and basically not dismiss it you may disagree but but thank people for for the feedback because what's going to happen as we go forward is is that is that no nobody the right answers are going to basically come by come about through collaboration in teams teams are going to be the primary structure and leaders will have a team and leaders will need the best input from those teams and and the likelihood of them getting that input is higher if their teammates trust them but also if their teammates basically can identify the other thing about being vulnerable is is when people, and it depends on the type of mistake, it depends on whether there's lives involved, it's the whole gamut. But this, this idea that leaders are perfect and we want everybody else to be perfect. Perfect is a goal and, in the, and perfect is an objective. But the reality of it is, is nobody's perfect. And if you want the buy-in from your people and you want them to be able to basically, when you're in the midst of something digitally going on, to be able to feel they can say, I think this may be this, without having to worry about whether a leader is going to jump down their throat, all right? And the reason they may not believe the leader is going to jump down their throat, the leader has shown him or herself takes ownership because 
very few leaders have done the training that everyone is going to need to do. Okay, very few leaders are at the point because the model has been different. All right, the model has been different. Um, and it goes back to this concept of, 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 of New Smart, which is in the Humility book, which some of you may have read, and it's in this book. The, the, you know, the concept I'm defined not by what I know or how much I know, but by the quality of my thinking, listening, relating, and collaborating. My mental models are not reality. They're just my generalized story of the world. I'm not my ideas. I must decouple my ideas, all right, from my ego. I must be open-minded. And when you're having data in the digital world come in, the speed of change is such that nobody's going to be invincible. And so I think vulnerability is being able to acknowledge that I'm a human being. Technology is going to be, in many cases, smarter than all of us. And we're all going to have to improve and work on ourselves. And, you know, I want you to admit your mistakes. I'll admit my mistakes. And together, we'll figure out how to do it. I think that's vulnerability in the, in the digital age. Does Thank that you. Make sense? Does that make sense, Val? It, it sure does. Thank you. Great. Thank you, sir. And next up, we have Mr. John Hemleben, who had a question. Um, John, if you want to go ahead. Yeah, Dr. Hess, thank you for uh, for your time today. I really appreciate it. You've got me, uh, uh, you, you've kind of touched a, a, a topic that I've been, you know, experimenting with for a while here uh, in terms of something a little bit different than uh, the digital warfare. But uh, basically, we're trying to do joint acculturation through um, distance education programs, and it's uh, it's somewhat of a di very difficult task. And my uh, my big push is um, this concept of purity of open mindedness. Now, you mentioned open mindedness twice, because I've been uh, keying in on that, uh, which I think is is probably one of the key things here, one of the key elements of what you're talking about. Um, and the one thing about open mindedness that I that I've uh, kind of learned is self-evaluation um i'm not sure i heard you say that but i think you certainly implied that uh that we have to evaluate ourselves constantly in order to uh strip away some of the biases and, and uh some of our, our our notions of worldview and that sort of thing but there, there's a, another thing that's a little bit uh, as you were speaking i was trying to put myself into a, a war fighting environment um where does you know you say eliminate emotion um how do you or i should say yeah how do you account for adrenaline in this whole thing yeah i mean adrenaline will 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 speed things up and and what you it's it's a little bit like if you th think about a sniper um in a and think about how an excellent, what an excellent sniper does to basically increase the probability of his or her hit. Okay, um, and and so it's acknowledging, if you will, that adrenaline, but through your breathing, all right, through your breathing, and I've not, I've not worked with the. Marine Corps on this issue, my 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 knowledge comes from vis-a-vis -vis this issue comes from the research institutes that the Navy has set up out in San Diego that is basically focused on managing uh, adrenaline and fear in warfare. Um, and there's three different institutes, and they they serve the the Navy SEALs, uh, and and there's and their science reports, so to speak, and, and how they what they do. So it's acknowledging it, but then it's basically, you know, using using your breathing to basically get back to a calmer state, um, so that you can perceive. And I'm not, you know, and I'm talking about situations where you have the time to do that. 
uh, or the possibility that someone is not with a weapon, you know, facing you face to face. All right. And it's basically, you have no time to do anything other than to basically pull, uh, or shoot. Um, and so you're quite correct about this open mindedness, uh, thing, John, that is the opposite of open mindedness, which is closed mindedness basically will will in a digital age in in any age basically you won't basically perceive and make in your of the totality of what is going on in your decisions are going to be basically potentially limited and inappropriate and failures when you basically are are not open-minded and people are not open-minded generally because they quote are they know they know what's going they know what's going on they don't basically seek and open and yes evaluation is is, is highly important in in the methodology or the plan or the practices which i basically work with people on in in and that evaluation is on a daily basis a daily basis while people are building the behavioral competencies uh, and so the, the 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 emotional stuff is is really in from a military perspective is basically managing that fear and and managing uh, the impact the chemicals that have on your body so that basically you 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 are getting if you will the ultimate um, ability to if you will make make the shot not twitch not not react too fast et cetera et cetera and so that's that's that all is is really highly fear related does that make sense yeah i, I really believe that uh, fear is a that's a huge factor um but there's also you know the uh, the instinct of you know uh fight or flight um, yeah yeah you know we 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 have to we have to combat our instincts sometimes, but yeah. we also I think have to allow our instincts to uh, to take hold because they're not all bad. It's it's yeah. discerning which is and which isn't, and that uh, and sometimes we just don't have time to react in the, as you've already pointed out. So it's uh, yeah, and, this is a it's an interesting uh, it's a whole the, interesting notion, and I do believe in mental exercise. Uh, for our Marines, I mean, if we don't start doing that, we're uh, we're not going to achieve what we're trying to achieve on the modern battlefield. There's no no question in my mind about that. But uh, yeah, thank you very much. I, I really appreciate it. Yeah, thank thank you, John. I'll come back to your instincts, in, in, instincts, in which I will I will call in, intuition. Uh, the science on that basically also says that that the i'm searching for the word the cleanest instinct instincts or the most valid intuitions basically do arise in us if internally we're more in a, a state that's not fight or flight or not um uh, we're not overcome by uh, uh fear uh, because intuition or instincts is highly uh, uh, subconsciously the subconscious mind plays a big role in that and as you know and so what's coming up out of that subconscious highly influences if you will the conclusion which highly includes the the behavior so it's that also i think there's there's a part of it is is that somehow and in, in um the, the 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 science on sense making which comes out not necessarily out of the military but comes out of the um, um forest fighter forest fire fighters people that are you know jumped into to, to stop fires and they got to make the call about the wind or this or the feelings and etc the, the research there on how they make sense of the situation sort of confirms what you're saying in the sense that it comes down to what we're what's coming up inside of us.
But the key is that is not to have that tainted by fear, over tainted by fear and over tainted, if you will, by fear or flight, because it may it's you, you, you may have a different intuition or, or, or action than if you had it and you were basically aware of the situation that it was deadly. But at the point of listening to what's coming up. It's 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 a hard it's it's hard, but I think it's going to be even. It's going to be relevant and it's going to be relevant when you have people sitting in a bunker or sitting in a facility that is not under attack. That's basically sitting with with the uh, um, screens in front of them and basically uh, engaged in digital warfare with the enemy. All right. Real time. All of this, all of these types of feelings and et cetera, are going to be there in that room, and that's why it, it's the, the 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 training and everything is not just people that are going to be in the battlefield. The battlefield is going to be in in a lot of cases in a secure room. Yeah, and you know what's interesting about that is that um, they don't won't necessarily have that fear factor. And uh, not having that fear factor is going to give them an advantage. Maybe, maybe one of the uh, answers to that is: is how do we infuse fear into that situation for those that are in that kind of a environment? Well, it, but, it, it, I, it, I don't want to dominate the conversation, but I, I, I find this fascinating, and I really appreciate it. Thanks. Thank you for your questions. Great, thank you very much, Dr. Hamilton. And uh, Professor Hess, I had another question. Or actually, I have a question for you while we're. Um, I'll wait for other folks to throw more in there, but so uh, kind of as we were talking about before um, we went live here, the DOD has some sort of structural things that would need to be changed or updated, um, you know, from, uh, you know, older, you know, essentially sort of 20th century industrial age models of talent management, training, things like that. Um, yeah, we, we got it. It's been, a, you know, it's kind of a long occurring issue. We realize it's got to change, but Outside of the DOD, have you in this model you're talking about, have, can you identify maybe any organizations that you've come across that are, in fact, leaning into this uh, to successfully navigating the digital age, as you sort of describe it, and preparing their people um, to, to do so as well, to thrive in it? Yeah, the the answer, the answer is there are organizations doing this. Uh, they are not. Um, They are not the majority by any means, and it's highly sort of dependent upon, and I'll go to the business world to start, the industry they're in, okay? If you're in the financial industry, you see more of this. If you're in the media industry, you're in the technology industry, you see more of this. If you're in a... You, you don't see it in the healthcare industry as much. You don't see it in the education industry as much. Um, you don't see it in the manufacturing industry as much. Um, you see it. So where it's being picked up in the business side is, is where is the volat wh where is the speed of change and digital intrusion happening the fastest and being embraced and once the digital is embraced, the people and the people are are not training the people and bringing the digital in. The digital is coming into certain industries, and then people are realizing that wait a minute, we got to basically to optimize this. We've got to have a different culture, different behaviors, a different way of working, and the, basically the digital creates the demand for this, at least on the the business side. Um, I've seen probably probably the uh, from a we'll call it governmental agency viewpoint uh, the uh, parts uh, uh, a special uh, branch of the United of the Department of Treasury uh, which is highly involved in the the, the global uh, issues vis-a-vis -vis the 
um, movement of money and transfers of money, everything. They have been involved in this for some years. Uh, uh, the parts of the uh, Navy that I've worked with have been involved in this for quite a while. Um, so I've seen it there. When I look at uh, the education industry, the indication industry is nowhere near where it needs to be on the uh, approach of uh, training people in, uh, you know, in, in high school and in community colleges and colleges to be able to think and behave in the ways that are going to be needed in the digital age. Um, I think that pl other places where this is uh, probably ahead of where we are is in s some of the um, special operation divisions of some of our adversaries. Right, thank you. That's a very, very happy thought there to end on <laughs> or to end that question on. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm sure it's it's quite true. We, we often seem to be on the back foot sometimes with this um, this new age that we're in. So uh, I know we're coming up on here on an hour. Um, to our director, Ms. Jackson, ma'am, did you have another question you wanted to ask? Uh, sure. I'm not sure this will um, bring it home in a, in a happy manner as you wish, Ian. But um, but my question, <laughs> my question is is applicable both in the classroom and out. Um, and it's about having meaningful conversations in this day and age where you have people that disagree with one another. It's becoming increasingly difficult, as I think we're all aware. Um, wh what are some best practices for the, you know most of the folks on the line here involved in graduate level education um, to be able to foster an environment where people can disagree amicably? Thanks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That that is a major issue. Um, basically, the let me let me try and put it in a. a the framework that I use so people can have a little bit of background in that, you know, and that doesn't mean they have to accept the framework, but this to know where I'm coming from. Um, if you start with the fact that we're suboptimal learners and we're highly biased and we seek confirmation of what we believe, uh, if you will, and we are heavily oriented towards emotional defensiveness when our views are challenged um, and so just say that we're you know if you if you agree with the science that we're suboptimal learners when you bring people together all right when you bring people together those conversations are going to have ego components and negative ego components negative emotional reactions uh, people not truly trying to understand each other and the science is pretty clear or the or the, the science is clear but also it's it's clear from looking and in, in being inside of organizations that are making the transformation we're talking about that collective the science of collective intelligence is going to be very important the intelligence of the team because Everybody will, if the team is appropriately diverse, people will bring their views and different views, different backgrounds to the table, and people will bring different biases to the table. The type of biases is the same, but what they, people will perceive what I don't perceive, and I'll perceive something they don't perceive. So, okay, we got five people sitting around the table or eight people sitting around the table. How do we get to what I call in the book, high quality making meaning conversations? Well, Basically, that that is more likely if people get to know each other personally, all right, and and understand that everybody has their view, but also understand that the likelihood that any one person's view is right, either all the time or most of the time, that people can have different experiences. And so people will be open to feedback and hearing different views if there is the intention if there's a reason why they should do this it all comes down to why why should i listen to you okay well because we're working together and 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 we want to be successful 
or if you know maybe you have something I don't know. So it, there's got to be some common reason that I'm willing to basically listen. And if I can start listening, I can also maybe open up and, you know, and maybe if you don't attack me and I don't attack you and we ask questions before we respond and we start behaving where we care about what the other person thinks and I try to understand you, you're trying to understand me, you get a caring, trusting, more trusting type of environment where people basically at that point in time can make the transition to having better conversations, depending on the topic, depending on the people and the emotions, it, it comes down to back to the, to the, the, to the why, why should I listen to you? What's in it for me? And unless everybody has worked through that why and there's conversations about why are we in this meeting why is this team together what is the purpose of this team any of us have got their own answer you don't need the other four of us to go do what you want and so it's sort of you got to help people create a different story that there is a benefit to them to listening there's a benefit to them now, they won't listen that well if they don't trust you. So the more you can basically show people that you're not going to attack them, you'll build the more of a, you know, okay, this person's not this evil person I thought they were. And, and so that's sort of the, the, the if you will, the, the process that's, and that's, the words I'm using are not, we'll call it scientific words. The words I'm using are, are, or human words, but that's what the science is is showing, and and that is a huge issue, uh, um, all through our society. But it's it's really a very huge issue in the the uh, not because the military is doing anything wrong in the military, because of the the diversity, uh, but also because of the historical. Um, uh, command and control um, uh, being so dominant because if you think about the digital age and people are going to be basically sitting at mach in mach machines, computers, and basically digital warfare is going to be fought basically by people making judgments and, and, uh, uh, and, and sending the, the, the forays and the instructions. Um, so if you if you think about what's necessary in those those situations, it is that what's my checks and balances? You know, there's a reason why two of us are looking at these things, and I got to trust you, and we can't be playing games with each other, and we can't be competing, and so therefore we got to make sense of this in a way that even though we're different we come about it there is a purpose that we're buying into and a way of being that we're buying into great thanks great. good advice for uh for work and for uh, families i think so thank you great thank you ma'am all right got one more question we'll get to and i think we'll wrap it up uh at the hour so next we have uh dave sonye uh, if you want to go ahead and ask your question sure um, if you see a lot of the young Marines now, you know, in the barracks, they're, they're playing video games, you know, they're gaming, uh, you know, Call of Duty, all kinds of things with a lot of sensory impulse, you know, disassociation from the emotional, you know, carnage and things like that. Would it be a fallacy to think that, uh, you know, there's any benefit or value in that, you know, as far as their warfighting abilities, or do you think that uh, there may be some value in it? And if so, is there uh, any types of gaming that might be better than others? over the the answer is is i i think there is value in it uh and the answer is is there certain type of gaming that's better than others i'm not a gaming expert i can't uh, i think that i think my my belief is my hypothesis is, is that basically one thing that the the you know all branches of the military going to have to end up doing is 
creating creating warfare games uh, that uh, are going to be constantly updated and used in um, training and not only in 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 the basically uh, initial training but basically as you know senior senior leaders um, senior senior leaders will be will be using I'll call them digital war games in small te small teams playing games and then having rigorous after action reviews because in effect you're testing yourself out you're in effect training yourself for what you what's going to happen when you go in that bunker and so i think that um, that um, war war you know um and i think that the ability to be um and so i do believe games will be helpful i do believe they'll be necessary for training i think that they they won't get you there without the human transformation vis-a-vis -vis, uh what i call um, the uh, we'll call it the mastery of self and, and i think that that's going to be a a uh, and and there are in parts there are parts of the various arms of the military that uh, that do that do this uh, the real hard work on from the emotional side and not only the physical the emotional the thinking etc uh, and um, you know you've historically seen that in the special operations groups uh, more than you've seen it in the non or the, or, or the uh, traditional groups I think that's going to be scaled completely throughout the, 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 the military. And um, so, yes, I think that could be very important. Unfortunately, I don't have, I'm, I'm ignorant on where to send you to one of the best games. Thank you, sir. Well, thank you. And I, I will make a plug for the Krulak Center here and that if, if you're looking for recommendations in that area, we don't have the whole answer. Uh, but part of what we try and do is is offer some suggestions in the realm of digital gaming as well as sort of you know more traditional tabletop analog gaming. There's there's a lot there that can help with you know putting people in that situation, putting them in that virtual room in a uh, in a in an I believe room before they do it for real. Okay, so uh, that takes us to the end of the questions. Um, Professor, do you have any final thoughts for us? No, I, I I appreciate the questions. The good, all of them were very good questions. I I obviously wish all of you the best on your journey, and uh, and I invite you to em, 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 embrace embrace the 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 what I believe is the reality that um, the digital age is going to transform warfare and transform uh, the Marine Corps. And I invite you to be on the cutting edge and leading edge of figuring it out. And uh, because time is of the essence. And uh, I salute you for your service and I'm appreciative and uh, thank you for having me. Great, and I extend our thanks to you again on behalf of the Krulak Center and Marine Corps University for joining us on the podcast. Maybe we'll get a hat trick here in the future here this year and get you on another time. Uh, you know, maybe later on in the year as the students are on board. So uh, thanks again to you, sir, and then thanks to everyone in our audience for joining us today. And as, we're, as I said before, as we get into AY22, we already have a number of very exciting episodes in the works, starting with next week, where we will host a panel, including Stephen Krasner, Michelle Berry, Stephen Hademan, and former Ambassador Carl Eikenberry to discuss a research project to which they all contributed under the theme of good enough governance, humility, and limits of foreign intervention in civil wars and weak states. And I, I found that humility uh, aspect of their thing very timely for, uh, for jumping off from your presentations here. Um, and then following that, we are also gonna talk about wargaming, a lot of wargaming with several of our non-resident fellows coming on through the months of August and September to discuss the different approaches that they have taken with wargaming in the educational realm. So make sure you're following us on social media for these and other upcoming events, and we'll see you all starting next week. Thank you. Education is what's important. Training, preparation for the expected. Education, preparation for the unexpected.